up your head, beat up your body Get on the bus, it's time to party It's Gregory, it is a Saturday night Gregory Take your socks off and take your pants on Get in the car Everybody, welcome to... Fr- mm, shit, I started... I started before he started. I think he started great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Friday Night Greg. Friday Night Energy on a Wednesday morning. I'm here with uh, old Tickly Gary. Yeah. <laughs> that felt good. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> you went higher, too. I like to. That I like fun. to touch you. We hey. got a little stain here. Oh, man. What is oh, that? I think that's ketchup. Oh, what'd you eat? I don't know, but these are the jeans I wear all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it could be any meal that I've had in the last two months. You're one, your your comedy jeans? Or they're just I have comedy jeans. jeans. I have another pair of jeans, but they require uh, ironing or you know steaming, and I it's just by the time I'm ready to leave the house, it's just I'm not doing it. I had other pants on actually before tonight, tonight, today. You steam jeans? I'll steam. Why them. do you have steam jeans? Well, I'll I didn't steam. write any questions for this interview. Yeah, so well, this, this was a, this is how that was a great first question. <laughs> Why do I steam jeans? You know, I feel it's so much easier than ironing. So I just kind of went on board with the whole steaming thing. I'll steam anything. I don't iron any pants steam. or jeans. Yeah. What they get is what they get. Nothing. You never iron anything. You just go with the flow. I put it in the wash. Yeah. Uh, it comes out. However it comes out is how I wear it with everything. Right. You're natural. I'm a natural man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, like natural. It. <laughs> I like it. You know what? I So I actually, it's always in the back of my head why I steam or if like if a shirt is wrinkled. Because one time I was on stage, this is very early on when I was doing comedy mm-hmm. at Ha. And uh, I like, I guess I got into it with a guy that was there. And then he yelled out, uh, well, at least my shirt's not wrinkled. <laughs> and that's always stuck with me. That's like... <laughs> It's like haunted me. I'm like, I just never want that to be yelled out again. And I've, I've before I leave, I'm always like, is this, is this creased? Is Allie, tell me. And like, she doesn't even give a shit. Allie's my wife. If anybody cares, but the weakest insult. Yeah, had but nothing. But it had an effect. <laughs> but it took you years. Yeah. It's still there. Yeah, he's the way you were in a perfect game. And if he's listening to Friday Night, Greg, just know that I steam, or you know, if I, I iron, if I have to, if I'm in a hotel, I, I'll <laughs> he iron. might be. These are the kind of fans we we have. Um, no. Uh, By the way, real quick, do you ever? No, does nobody to be real quick. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm very unprepared today, and I feel very awkward about it. Okay, I guess I'll ask the question. If you don't mind. But do you ever iron at a hotel? Do you ever take out their iron? I, I let me tell you, similar to your story, I have a story. Yeah. I used to iron everything, and I burned my hand one day, <laughs> and I went never again. I'll never iron anything again. I'll yeah. only iron. I'll steam things every now and again if uh, Tita's crying. Right. If yeah. she's if she's just crying at the base, yeah, we walk down the stairs and she goes, you can't look like this. And I'll go, all right, I'll steam it. Right. But right. No. Yeah, but what did you ask me? Get it together. I don't even remember. No. Do you ever steam at the uh, at a hotel or iron at a hotel? No. What I do is and this is the move I do. I take all my clothes out of the out of the suitcase and I give it like a whoop, whoop, uh, and then yeah. I lay them all flat on the extra bed. Yeah, that has as to not do anything or I'll hang them in the <laughs> you, you always have two mattresses. <laughs> I always do. I always say, give me a double. <laughs> give me a two people room uh, and then they'll, they'll be here. And yeah. every time I walk by, I get really in my head and I go, they're coming. I swear they're coming. Right, right. right. Um, but I'll hang the stuff in the bathroom when I shower. And hopefully that'll do something. Yeah, That's it. sometimes it helps. I I'll iron and I used to not. I'm a I'm a germaphobe enough mm-hmm. of a germaphobe where I, but I got over it enough where I, I'll iron now. But I used to think that like people would piss in the in the uh, actual iron. Yeah, and or do something. You would do, piss do, in the iron. Something, you know, it's like dirty awesome. water or it's like, you know, you don't know where that. I was at a comedy condo once, and I was like, man, I need mayo. Which one? It was in uh, Tampa. Tampa. Oh, that's the most disgusting one. We're at the uh, Improv. No, the side splitters. Yeah. Oh, okay. And I remember going, ah, mayo. Yeah. And then someone went, you know, some comedian came in that mayo. And I went, you ruined it. Right. Because I would have been putting mayo. I would have used all of the condiments. Right. Either ruined it or saved you. Or saved <laughs> it. But the cum isn't going to kill me. The cum wouldn't I wouldn't have you, known. Yeah. Or it would have came out of my sandwich. I would have saw cum and I would have went, yeah, you ruined my sandwich. Right. But yeah, I'd rather just not know. I don't think you see cum. I mean, like you can't. <laughs> it might. You can't really determine it's cum unless it's on you. You know, yeah. like you, it's your cum. But yeah. Well, listen. Let's stop beating around the bush. You're here for some real questions, and I got some real deal questions on the docket I have written here uh, that I'm going to get to <laughs> on the docket. That These is are the a, hot yeah. button. These are like, oh, over 50 questions. Before wow. we get to that, 
That's fun. We were talking about toys before you got out of here. What did you have growing up? What toys did you have growing up? Well, um, I had video games, but, but obviously before video games, you always had toys. Why did I feel like you, that was like a that was like a dickhead the way you said that? You had video games, like you were a rich boy. And I was <laughs> well, I, because that was my major. I, from what I remember growing up with toys, to me that was my my toy of like spending time playing video games. But um, I did have toys, and my toys that stick out with my, in my mind. I mean, I had the little green army men. You had the what were you in the 40s? Yeah, exactly. Little green army man? It's like a yeah, the guy with like the, the rifle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, I know. It's you sad. <laughs> I was yeah. like, when I make it someday, like, I'm going to have video games. I was like, I didn't know you were so... Man, you need cash now. How are you doing now? Are you doing okay now? Well, I don't have I don't have toys like this, you know? <laughs> so uh, little green army man. So, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking about, you know, the beginnings. The beginnings. Right, 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 so, right, right, right. Uh, you know, I had a yo-yo. No, uh, <laughs> slinky. We kicked a can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, but uh, you know, looking around, I see you had the GI Joe. So I, you know, I'm starting to remember what I had. But my GI Joe. I mean, you have what your GI Joe, the new GI Joe. This is one now. is a six inch GI Joe. Yeah, these are six, six inch. I had. It was almost like a metal GI. It was. They were a almost metal? like metal. They were like almost made of metal. From what I, I couldn't be wrong with the type of material it was made of. But they were like this high. They were three point five. Yeah, those are those up there. Look up top there. That's the three, yeah, three and a quarter. They're called. Do you see the helicopter? Oh, the helicopter I had. I yeah, had the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. And there's a GI Joe, a couple GI Joes in there. Those oh. are three and a quarter. They were smaller. Yeah, they were not metal. What were they made? They of? had a screw in the back. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Yeah, they were hard plastic. And you, okay, yeah, metal. But uh, no, that's what I remember. And I had the helicopter. And the story of the helicopter. I have a story of the helicopter. Tell me. So this is a Joe Hell, and this is a newer model. I don't no, know. It's the old one. That's oh, the okay. classic. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was that color, but yeah, I knew it had the the uh, transport that comes down, whatever yeah, that yeah. thing is. I guess you know they could bring a car into it or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Get your okay. Jeep. Get your so Jeep. I didn't remember if it was that color or not, uh -huh. but I had it on like a top shelf in my room, mm -hmm. and I remember we had a babysitter over. This is one of my older oldest memories, and I had to go to bed. And my my sisters who were older than me, they were able to stay up, and I was upset about that. And I remember I like climbed onto the shelf, and I was just like perched on it where that also that helicopter yeah. was just trying to hide and say hey come and find me like yeah. after i was supposed to go to sleep and they came into the room they're like where the hell is he and <laughs> i like just made panther. like one slight movement and i knocked the helicopter over and i remember it broke something i think it was broke the the, the propeller uh -huh. and part of it was always missing after that uh -huh. and i remember being so pissed that i did that because it was such a nice toy wow and uh but yeah that's my that's my story is, this is the clip yeah that's the clip that's gonna <laughs> that's get that's a million views that yeah. story of your well, i'm trying i mean <laughs> you're throwing toys at me i'm doing my best i'll i'll give you another the other toy i, I had yeah. the other toy i, had I want to talk was, about all your toys was so I had a Batman. Yeah, don't touch that. Not like, yeah, like five thousand dollars. I, I mean, this no, does look. This looks nice. No, I mean, it's a fancy Batman, but you touch it. I'd but I had a, it was it. a black Batman, and he had his utility belt, and it came out. Yes, that was the Batman the movie Batman yeah. figure because he had the string that came out. It was from when the Michael Keaton movie came out. The package had a gold back lining. I remember that. Batman. I had that. I had a Superman too that had a clip. That uh, I mean, you're the toy guy. Yeah, yeah. And it had his cape would clip like yeah. a little thing. It was a little like U ring. Yeah, that, that clipped on the cape. And he had a red head. Yeah, red uh, cape. Yeah, and red head. Yeah, his dick was red. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and <laughs> or anything. What else I had? Um, I had. It's so funny. I, I actually, would... it came with a ring and a kryptonite ring, and you, it would if you put it like chat, it would he would fall over. This, do you remember this? Yes, I do. But what I'm more interested in is how sad these toy stories are. Is that you go over the like we had one Batman, I had one Superman, I had some army men, and yeah. I had a helicopter that broke. I, well, I'm I, you know I'm trying to recall, but you weren't I, obsessed was, with toys growing up. I, I no, I was obsessed with toys. I I lay them out, and the worst part about you know laying them out, and after you start playing with them, is mm -hmm. then you have to clean them up. Which you obviously have not done. I do not clean them yeah. up. No, I leave them out I live, because when you have them out, you can play with them easier. Yeah, I wish so. I wish I had something like this where I was always able to have them out. My mom always made me put them back, you know, in a drawer or whatever. That was the move, and uh, you had to like, uh, you know, parents suck. You know, yeah. when you get older, you can leave. Did you see my Tie Fighter? Look how big that thing is. Star oh. Wars, it's huge. Oh yeah, I so I wasn't into Star Wars, so I hate to stop you right well, there. But I saw, I mean, I saw like a couple of them. You know, I I don't. I, <laughs> I know, I know the basics of Star Wars. I had micro machines. Oh, those were fun. Um, we I had a little, kids. I had a little mat, you uh -huh. know that, that you know take the cars yeah. and I would set it up, have the Green Army men, you know, all around. The little micro and machines and the Green Army men playing together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think what I had Ninja Turtles, of course. Ninja Turtles were huge. Yeah, Did you, you, 
you uh pe- I peg you as a starting lineup guy. So I didn't have uh, many start. <laughs> you pegged me wrong. <laughs> Could not have been. No. I had a, I had a few starting lineups. Yeah. It was always a thing where uh, I was into collectibles, like sports memorabilia and things like that. So I was always encouraged. Oh, you can't open these. Right. So starting lineup. Uh, the worst uh, thing was, to do to a child. I know. So I had a few starting lineups that I didn't open, and then I kind of didn't. I I always wanted more, but. It, uh, my, you know, my dad. He was always he was also into sports memorabilia. He would be like, "Oh, it devalues them." Which the truth is now, it's it has no value. Starting lineup has no value because so, all those things that people thought were going to make them money, everyone yeah. bought them. So then yeah. there's a million of them. So yeah, there's a lot. Anything. Yeah, the so, trick to collecting anything is get something that you love, because if you love it, someone else will love it and eventually miss it. Yeah. So don't get something that you're like, "Hey, this is going to be worth money," because that's like, well, then everyone's going to get it. No one gives a shit about when it's gone. You want the shit that someone's going to go like, man, I had that and I want that again. Yeah, I'll make, pay yeah, $10. Makes, it makes sense. And uh, I, I don't know where those toys are. Maybe they're somewhere. But I, uh, I mean, obviously, they mean nothing to you. <laughs> You're like, you think that's the world's shittiest you know, toy collection. Well, I mean, yeah, it wasn't really very good. It had, I, I had a, a, a Superman. Man. One thing I remember, I mean, it wasn't really a toy, but it was uh, a Superman that had a suction cup and it would, it would plug into like, two sides of a wall so it looked like superman flew through it yeah this is the kind of thing you get like a dollar store oh okay. that was a birthday gift to my, <laughs> my parents <laughs> hey, your parents seem to love you yeah. your parents are divorced <laughs> yeah so this is when i get into the hot look there's a gotcha in yeah you. yeah it's, they're divorced yeah yeah they split, you still they love split your mom? that gift 50 50 yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah they still love my mom yeah she's all you right. still love her yeah she's all right she's fine really yeah, yeah. you talked to her every now and again did i meet her I met your sisters. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. On America's Got Talent. We, sure we did America's Got yeah. Talent together. Um, I know. Yeah, you met my sisters. You were part of the family. Your sisters and me bonded. I yeah. love your sisters. I know. Yeah. They look so goddamn similar, though. Yeah, yeah that's how family works a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. I thought they were twins. They're like 10 years apart. Three. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very good. Danielle. So, uh, they're two years apart. Two years apart. Yeah. Right. That's pretty close. Danielle and Jamie. And Jamie. Yeah, I was going to say Jamie, but you cut me off. Yeah. Because uh, I love them both equally. Yeah. And I don't want one to think that I. Did not re- I remember both of them. They were both oh, like yeah. human beings. I'm sure, they remember you. They definitely. <laughs> no, no, of course they did. They have to. They might not. Yeah. They, I only time. have one friend. It's you. <laughs> yeah. Um, your dad. You want to talk about your dad? Uh, yeah, sure. You know, that's good. But your dad. Um, good guy. No, nah, he's not. He's, he's a, not a good guy. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't talk much. Well, your dad anymore. was a con man. Uh, yeah, possibly so the, still is. I have no idea. We're gonna get to that. Yeah. I want to know where you about your cons. Okay. You ever get a good con? You got a good good con going? I had well, I mean, I you know, did some illegal activity back in my day. You really? know, some of it, yeah. What's uh, the most illegal thing you ever did? I mean, Does this most, feel too interviewy? But no. Does this feel too interviewy? I think it feels, you know. Is this how we usually hang out? We're still I, feeling it I, out. I, yeah. <laughs> I think it feels good. All right. Because I you know you made the trip. I did make it made trip. I came Jersey. I know. But you came from we just did a gig together. You oh. made that trip. Oh, we gotta talk about that too. Yeah. But again, I got paid that. You got paid. Not, I'm not getting paid for, for this, man. Not even gonna have a good time. But I'll tell you, as far as uh cons answer go, all of the questions, any of them. I'll answer all of them. As far as cons go, I sold cocaine. In you college, sold cocaine? In college, yeah. And where did you get cocaine? A guy from Queens named Mike. Would drive it up to University at Buffalo, and I would buy. How'd you meet as, Mike? I met him through somebody in my fraternity uh-huh. knew uh, that this guy w- like comes up and drops off like cocaine to uh-huh. like people in Buffalo, and he was at the time, I guess, just uh, he didn't have many contacts in Buffalo. Like he was just he had less context than he normally does. And mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, I would love, you know, I reached out to this guy. I was like, I love to get some cocaine. Yeah. And to buy he, or to sell. He, yeah. To, uh, to sell originally to sell always to sell. Yeah. Oh, all right. And I mean, I did some too. Yeah. I've never done it, but yes, I mean, to me Whatever. it's, I, yeah, uh, I mean, I don't do it anymore, but I don't think it's worth it personally. Sure. And I, he just would bring up and I started buying ounces and then eventually I was just buying like quarter pounds, which is four ounces. Is it a lot? Uh, it's a decent amount. Yeah. Is that like how long is dead jail time? I mean, I, I mean, I don't know, but probably I would have gone to jail for Life. like eight, eight years or four, Whoa. you know, four to eight years, something like that. How much money you make off a pound of cocaine? Um, off of a pound. Mm-hmm. Well, that, well, this is a quarter pound. Or a quarter pound. So I was, I would make, I would say profit. It was 16. I would make $1,600 off of an ounce. So, 
uh, close to almost six thousand dollars. What? Yeah, I mean, I would a do month? some too. Um, I mean, a quarter pound would take me probably depends on where I was in the school year because there are certain events that sure. kids would always be doing cocaine, such as I remember in the beginning of the school year, you could go through two ounces in a week. Whoa. So, but that wasn't realistic for what it always was. Uh-huh. So I would say that, yeah, in a month you could go through a, a complete uh, quarter pound. Could you step on it? You know what I mean? You know what that means? So, yes. I don't really know what it means. So, tell me what it means and then tell me if you did it. So, stepping on it would be like you could add a little product to it. So, Mm. you know, beefs up the bags. But I would just, I would just short the bags. So, you would say, (laughs) people would say, oh, this is a, you know, you a a gram, but you're really putting in like 0.7 or 0.8. And most people don't have a scale. And even if they did have a scale, it'd be like, well, that's what I'm selling. Right. The, you know, it off as, you know, who the hell would 0.7 for, you know, I guess it was, I want to say it was $50. Whoa. Did you save any of that money? I did when I was coming out of college. I mean, now it's, yeah, now it's long gone. Yeah. But yeah, as far as when I was leaving college, you know, I, I want to say I left with like twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000. You made money in college. I made money. I paid for everything in college minus my tuition, but I was. Who paid your tuition? My mom. And then, oh, but nice. I never had to ask her for any money. Sure, when sure. I was except in for school. the except for the tuition. Except for yeah, except for the tuition which she paid <laughs> or for. the cocaine. But the, the tuition, you know, was a. I mean, obviously, college, no matter what, is expensive. But it was a state school. Well, that's great. So it you know wasn't crazy expensive. And any hairy moments? Uh, my apartment got broken into at, when I was. It was kind of. I was right when I was about to stop doing it because I was graduating, uh-huh. and I didn't want to do it after after college uh, for obvious reasons. I kind of wanted to mm-hmm. just. Get on with Use my your life. degree. Yeah, <laughs> use my degree, and you know, not get arrested. And I, I figured, hey, I did it for you know three years. I did it starting from my sophomore year on, and I didn't want to keep on doing it. And then I started uh, being like, all right, I got to you know stop, get out of this. Yeah. And graduating was the perfect time to uh, stop doing it. I left for to go to Toronto with a bunch of friends. Yeah. And apparently, my roommate he forgot his key. One yeah. day, like right, very early on, in, in like right before we were leaving, and he had to climb into our apartment, and he, he like moved a garbage pail, and he climbed through a window, and these kids across the street knew that I sold cocaine, and they saw how he got into the apartment, and next thing I know is like when he came back from Toronto, our place was broken into, there was shit everywhere, and uh, they found like my room. They didn't find the cocaine, uh, and they but they stole my laptop. Where was the cocaine hidden? This is the best part. The cocaine was hidden in my laptop case with a whole bunch of money. And they just, they took they the took laptop. The computer. But they took, yeah, they took my computer, but they didn't take the laptop How case. much cocaine was there? How much money worth? I don't know. I don't, from what I remember, I don't think it was that much. I want to say it was less than a half an ounce. So probably, you know, anywhere from like, you know, seven, 800 bucks worth of cocaine. But I, worth but I had, I probably had like two to three grand in cash that wow. was there too. Man, and how much is a computer worth? I mean, computer was probably at the time it was a uh, one of those like a MacBook. Nice. So, I want to say it was like a thousand. That was the hairy situation. No one ever put a gun on you. I was like, give me the cocaine, Gary. No, nothing like that. Never had that. I mean, you'd always deal with people who want cocaine at late hours, but not nobody annoying. ever tried. Rot- yeah, annoying. That's what you know for the most part. How'd you know? Did you do like a test to see if they were cool? The people that I was selling to, and this was part of why, you know, I was doing it, were all people that I kind of knew. So it was kids in my fraternity, yeah, girls okay. in sororities. So it was, you know, people who were in the same circle. Did you ever have sex with someone for cocaine? Uh, well, they might have had sex with me. Like, were they yeah. like, hey, let's have sex with me? Let's, Ooh, well, you know, how many, which guy? Which, 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 which how guy? Many guys, was, how many guys at one time did that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would imagine, because I remember I was at a party once with DeVito. We were at this yeah. party, and uh, we were not. We were in uh, we were in Hoboken, and some woman comes up to Anthony. Anthony has a white blazer on and sunglasses, yeah. like an idiot. She comes up to him, and she goes, you got cocaine? <laughs> and he went, oh, yeah. And then she started making out with him. And then she went, let's go do that cocaine. And he went, I don't have any cocaine. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> It's like I just you just like went with the flow, but I was like, is that just happening to people who have cocaine? I've yeah, never, I, I've never even seen cocaine in real life. I mean, here's the thing: you're not dealing with the you know classiest act, but when you're in college, you kind of just go with the flow. Yeah. So you know, it wasn't a great label to have, but I was you know the cocaine guy. Yeah, and I had actually I, had, I mean just like how you know I started a, a dog walking company eventually, right. but I You've had always pe- been a good businessman to an extent. 
but I, I had people who were selling cocaine and where, so if I wasn't out, you know, during the you night, you had people working for you, yeah, you were a, a cocaine kingpin. I had a couple people, you know, that were selling bags and stuff and they would oh, make money man. and they'd make good money. And of course <laughs> they're kids in my fraternity. So people I could trust and, you know, they would, you know, I give them say, you know, 20 bags of, you know, 0.7 grams were worth a certain amount. So then they would have to pay me back X amount and then they would, you know, profit the rest. So do they pay you first or do they, did they buy it from you and then they would take the rest? I don't or? remember exactly what I had to do, but most likely it was just like they were on the boards for you have our, a gun. No, I didn't have a gun, but they would be on the, we would call it like the boards. The boards. So like, yeah, you're on the board. You're on the for, boards, man. You're on the yeah, boards. You owe, me, you owe me $400 and then, yeah. you know, I would get it and that I, you know, maybe I'd profit, you know, mm. 150, 175, and then they'd, they'd be able to profit, you know, 150 bucks too. But I wouldn't have to obviously do it. That's know, the, fucking the crazy. Labor. I did not know that. Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. So that would be like one of the biggest scams, you know, I did. It's a scam. You're I, a drug dealer. I, yeah, it's a drug lord. <laughs> you, were uh, the, you were the head man. And then I also, I mean, probably, I mean, my biggest, I mean, and you're good at this too. You're kind of thinking of a reason. Don't lump me in with you. <laughs> no, but, but, yes, but you're absolutely. good at. I'm a thief. You know, part of things are, you know, in terms of scamming, it's like problem solving. Yes. So it's you have how to, can I get, how can I figure out that loophole. Yeah. And that's what comedy is. Right. Com comedy is very much that. So you're figuring out how a joke works. So yeah. you can get from point A. You're like, oh, I have this funny thought, but how do I convey it so they could understand it or right. know, get my point across and make it funny. And someone says that with comedy, it's always like someone says this. Yeah. And I go, they go, this is a fact. And I go, I'm going to find a way to make that not a fact. I'm going to find a way the thing you said or the bad thing you said, I'm going to make it good. Or I'm gonna find a way. I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. flip it. That's that's to me what comedy was. Yeah, you. I mean, you, problem you can have this idea that on um, you know the idea itself doesn't make sense and people's point of view doesn't agree with that. Right. But, but if you could be convincing and yes. facts, and before you know it, you know, in a you know a twenty second statement, you're able to you know twist their minds and they're like, oh, that does make sense. And I mean, like what I would do is a lot of times in the beginning is I'm just gonna take anything like like rape. You go rape bad, then you go. Well, I'm gonna figure out a way to make it good. To make yeah. it good, there's yeah. gonna be a situation that's gonna make you all think and then make it silly. Right. And then right. You add a laugh at the end of that. Um, right. Kind of like you did with cocaine. But why? Why were you? What were you saying? You were saying something about like. Oh, so yeah, you know, one of the things about like trying to figure out how you could get from point A to point B, like say, you know, I mean, one of the things would be I wouldn't. I, who who likes studying? Nobody likes studying. Yeah. And I mean, some people do, I guess. No. Yeah. That's weird. Not you know? me. There's fucking weirdos. Some here. nerds. But I, you know, never wanted to waste my time, you know, reading or, or doing it, you know, things. And I mean, now I wish I did because right. I'm an idiot. But I, you know, a, a test would come up and I'm like, oh, I didn't study for this. And now I got to figure out how am I, how am I going to get through this? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could steal a test. How do you steal a test? So yeah. I started stealing tests very early. I mean, in high school, I was stealing tests left and right. How are you stealing tests? Figuring out, I mean, one thing was a, you know, one, for example, but I would cheat also, of course, but I would stealing always. Stealing tests is cheating. Yes. So we understand. But I mean, just, you know, your regular oh, yeah. everyday cheating. Yeah, too. yeah. You're snatching you know, grab. Yeah, I'd be, I always, I was always very good at looking at people's papers right. and, or, you know, having, you know, notes and, and stuff and not and being slick enough that I wouldn't get caught. Yeah. But as far as stealing tests, that became like my, my thing. Yeah. And I would find out where like the teachers kept the actual exams and yeah. I would go into like a drawer for, you know, an English or a math test. And, uh, I would go and I would have the test the day before, or, you know, a few periods before. And then I'd have somebody who actually knew the exam do it. And then I would have the answers for the exam uh, and it would be different things. Them? Like, no, how I mean, they would, they would be getting the test too. So that's how right. I would pay them. So they could you also know? look up the answers. Yeah. They would be able to figure it out and be like, here's the exam. So I was, uh, in high school, I was stealing a bunch of math, uh, math, Test specifically. I don't know how. I mean, how were you breaking into the rooms earlier? How I would you, go in. Geez, so, the, for example, this, this guy. Stuff. I remember Mr. Vanderbeek. Uh, he had a class, and I wound up doing this in, in college too. And I'll get to Mr. That. Vanderbeek if you're out there. Yeah, uh, he might, he's definitely not alive anymore. Yeah, I would go into his class, his his you know first second period class. My class was later in the day, mm -hmm. and he would be handing out the the tests mm -hmm. and everything. So I, while he was doing that, I would he was an old guy. I would go in his drawer and pull out the exam. 
First time I did it, I didn't realize that he had three separate exams, all different for all of his classes. Wow. And so ne- next time I would go, the second time I did it, I would go in and I'm like, oh, they're labeled like one, two, and three based off of like the orders of his classes. And then I started being able to get the actual right exam. And he had no idea that I was able to take that. Later in college. I'm so sorry. I need to. But how are you like? getting in there early how are you like well he already had a, he already had a class so he was going around handing out the actual exams and while he was doing that i'm going around to his drawer wow. very sneakily wow well, the class not even looking at you yeah nobody's looking at wow. him. I just figured Sneaky it out Gary. yeah and then i wound up in college i stole a midterm and a final mm-hmm. and another exam in a business class in a huge extra hall because the way that they were handing out tests and this was all for my practice of you know stealing from mr vanderbeek they would hand them out and they would all be laid out. So there was a, a class that was early in the morning and my class, which was later in the afternoon. They lay out all the exams in alphabetical order for the students that were there. Uh-huh. I would walk into the big lecture hall, which class wasn't mine, at 10 a.m. I'd take just a random person's test, uh-huh. grab it off of there, walk out of the lecture hall, and now I have the actual exam. And then I would give it to somebody so they could start giving me the answers, yeah. get, it, get it done. And then I would have the answers when I would go to the class at 2 p.m. Jesus. Yeah, I mean, so my I whole love thing it. was... It's crazy you're in comedy, though. I would imagine you'd be in the mob. Yeah. Some kind of Jewish I could, mob. I, I could have actually made it. Wow. So, yeah. and they, their whole thing was, you know, they would see that an exam was missing and it would just be like a mistake that, oh, we forgot this exam right. for, you know, whoever. Larry. Yeah, Larry. Let's say Larry. Yeah, Larry. Larry. Uh, Larry and Dieter. Gator? Dieter. Dieter. Like it was me. Yeah, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Gary. Yeah, I hear them. So okay. Uh, yeah, no. That's cool. Um can I tell you what I used to do? No. You know I was a thief? No, don't tell me. Never tell you I was a thief. Don't dirty... ever tell me. All right. Well, no, I want to hear it. What would you do? I was a rat a rat bastard thief. I always would steal. I always come up with ways yeah. to like I think I've sorry, Rad Dude Cast fans, if you've heard me do this because I would so a bunch of things I used to do. One of them was because I was poor, we didn't have any money, mm. similar to you with your army agreement. Uh I wanted rollerblades. Got on the bus, went to the Woolbrook Mall. Uh, go into the sports authority. Yeah. And uh, so what I noticed is uh, what, what I would do is I took the rollerblades, the ones that fit me, off the shelf, brought them to the return desk, and then I would go, I want to return these. And they would go, you need a, you, your receipt? And I go, receipt? I don't have a receipt. Are you crazy, your receipt? I forgot my receipt. Just return them. And they would go, no, you need a receipt. And I would go, well, I didn't bring my receipt. I want my cash. Give me the cash. And they would yeah. go, we're not giving you cash. So you're telling me I got to take these home? And they would go, yeah, I take them home. I go, well, then I'm going to take them home. And, then I, went, <laughs> and I walk out with the rollerblades. Oh, You'd wow. make such a big stink about returning yeah, them. Yeah. And they knew they couldn't return them. It's sleight of hand that yeah. they would just go like, oh, well, he clearly isn't just want rollerblades. Right, right. But I was cutting out the middleman. The middleman was money. Yeah. And I would get these fresh rollerblades. And we would do that every now and again. I had a lot of uh, uh, friends who were poor. And we would rollerblade together. And they didn't have any money for skates. So we would make like monthly trips to different sports authorities oh, that's great and just do these this this uh this uh return move and another big thing too is that you never we never wanted to do it when there'd always be a line so i'd have friends behind me waiting to buy something being right, online right. The pressure like, yeah. the pressure add the pressure add the pressure always go with the girl who was young or the guy who was young no one who looked confident someone who clearly hated their job or was right. just like and just keep it going and yeah. just keep it going and no one but no one ever went hey i think you took those off the fucking Right, right thing you, you, what i would and a lot of times i would just you take them then you just walk around the store for a while and then you'd make the return like it was like oh i was going to do this after i bought my other stuff right, right right you know um that was one i also That's used to one. we used to do a move when i used to work at sears sears in my department for the one year i was there uh most of the loss prevention was around like each department was like two three thousand dollars yeah that's how much would our department in car audio was seventy five thousand dollars <laughs> there was four employees so it was me, these three other guys, and uh, just three other guys, Todd. So I'll tell you, oh, my God, let me just tell you this real quick. And then you jump in when you want to jump in. You know, so no, I know this is your, this your is great. thing. So we used to, uh, so it was me, this guy, uh, I don't want to say his name. We'll call him uh, Henry, Yeah. right? Uh, his real name's Henry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Pierre, we'll yeah. call this guy Pierre, and his kid Todd, we'll just call him Todd, right? Uh, they were all like uh, Patterson, uh tattoos of like people praying right family member like hardcore 
looking dudes. And Todd was this six two skinny black guy, very much like Carlton, very nerdy, right? So when I first started working at Sears, mm -hmm. I'm working and um Angel oh, <laughs> Henry. Mark that down. We're gonna delete that out, Mike, if you can at twenty nine thirty nine. <laughs> Uh, Henry goes, uh, he's like, oh man, here's how I, I want to steal. Like, I, I want to, I want to get this Bose system. How would you do it? How would you do it? And they're yeah. talking about how they would do it. And the guy's like, I'd have my friend come, let him, you know, switch tags, run out. And I was like, nah, man, don't do it that way. Cause that you can get caught for that. I was like, what you should do is, uh, sell it, return it, but then mark it down as damaged. Then that takes 50% off of it. And every the way Sears worked was like every month uh. it wasn't sold, it would go down in price. Uh. So after like two months, just leave it in the stock room. Don't tell anyone. Right. That thing will mark itself down to 50 bucks. You have a thousand dollar system. You just pay 50 bucks for, and you have a receipt and a warranty. Wow. I would say like a month or two months later, or however long. I don't remember how. Angel. <laughs> 3031, cut that name. <laughs> Uh, Henry, ah, fuck it. I'm not giving last names. Don't cut nothing. Uh, <laughs> Henry comes up to me uh, and he puts a hundred dollar bill in my hand and he goes, yo, thanks so much. That Bose thing you did that worked and that him giving me the money was him signifying like yeah. you're in now, right, right? like you're in. And he was like, how do we do these car stereos? And I would go like, let me think like we got this one coming in. So it was like, this is how you want to do that. Right. Next thing we know it, we are sell. I mean, like just selling shit, just steal. I mean, I have a. I remember people would break into my car. I lived like a block out of Newark. Yeah, people would break into my car, take my stereo, and I would go. I don't mean shit. I don't care. I got a million of these. <laughs> anyway, the only guy we didn't talk to was the the kid Todd. Yeah, um, because he was like such a sweet guy, and he was very like whatever. Yeah. So to the book. Yeah, we never brought him in. Um, uh, one day security comes in. They walk Todd out in handcuffs, <laughs> and we go, dude, we, what happened? No one would say anything. I end up seeing Todd on um like a few years later, and I get the story, and I'm like, dude, we thought you went to jail. He goes, no, nah, they goes, they didn't. They fired me for not being on time, but they tried to walk me on cuffs to make it look bad, but they couldn't get me on shit. And I go, what did you do? And he tells me the story, but they couldn't get him. What he did, he stole. So Todd was stealing. He stole bigger than anyone else. He was the great. He was the he was the king. He stole an Infinity G35 from Sears. What? Sears doesn't sell cars. I yeah. know. That's how insane it was. What he did was he bought a car on his Discover card. Yeah. Right? Bought the car on Discover card. And then the way he did it, and it wasn't even like it was like his mom's card or some shit. It wasn't like directly him. What he did was bought the car on this credit card. Then what the way it would work is you could uh he would do returns. Similar to the thing I would do where he right. marks stuff down, but mark it down almost to zero. Return stuff, then sell it for like, I don't know how he would get rid of the merchandise, but there'd be, so then he would, uh, so I'm sorry. So the re there'd be returning stuff and the stuff and then sell it, but then there's never ever an object. Right. So essentially he's selling stuff that didn't exist. Oh, okay. So now there's more money in the register than there's supposed to be. And so that extra money, he would then go, oh, that's a $50 thing, $100 return. And then he would sell the return. No object. It's all gone. Now there's this extra money in the re register. He would use that to pay his Discover card, which you could pay at Sears. So he bought a car on a Discover card and then paid it off through oh, the these bullshit yeah. returns and got a car for his mother, Jeez. which was like insane. And we all kneeled. And they <laughs> couldn't figure out what he was doing. They knew it was something, so they ended up firing him on like tax evasion. You right, know, right, they got him for yeah, like yeah, yeah. for being uh, was tax, late. Yeah, but either way, yeah, they, late. they knew that he was doing something. Yeah, yeah, it's like amazing. But that was the thing. When working in like those stores, it was always like I ended up getting a job after that at Fortune Offs, which was like a sheet store because I was like, "There's nothing here I can steal, mm -hmm. and I don't want to do this anymore." Right. It was like every day you'd see security come up, and I'd be like, "Am I?" Is it it? They get me. You ever have that when you're dealing cocaine? Like you'd see a cop and you're like, is it? Am I over? Is it gone? Oh, totally. There's always that level of stress, right? You always had stress. I mean, I brought cocaine over the board, the Canadian border. I mean, they probably, oh, I always still want to go to Canada. So maybe I shouldn't say that. They're, they're pretty strict over there. I don't think they're paying for my Patreon. Oh, okay. Well, this might good. be a free episode. Yeah, Who do knows? whatever. But it, either way, uh, yeah, I mean, bring cocaine over the border. I was always scared of like, oh, I mean, I was. To sell or to party? It was to party. But yeah, I but doing that, it's like you. I mean, I we've gotten pulled over. I got pulled over at the border um, without cocaine, just because my friend didn't hear the uh, the border patrol tell them to pull over. Mm -hmm. Like right as you're going through like Niagara Falls area, 
and he didn't hear it. And next thing, what you don't hear what happens if you don't listen to the border patrol, sirens start going off. My my, this is my, oh my this is my my friend is with uh, this kid in my fraternity, Ronnie, yeah. one of the biggest dumbasses that you'd ever meet. And there's always things that happen to this kid. And being around him, it's almost like something's gonna like a. Uh, uh, an anvil is going to like fall on his head. Yeah. So we were uh, driving to go to Toronto and mm -hmm. we're driving. It's him, me and two other kids. And we're, we're partying. We're about to like, you know, get to Toronto and, and party, but we have to go through the border first. As we get to the border, uh, they tell him, Hey, you know, just, they see four guys in the car. They're like, you know, please just, you know, uh, pull over. He doesn't hear them. Just keeps driving. Next thing you know, these sirens start going off and people with, like guns oh start God. surrounding the car and we're like holy shit he's like what's happened i'm like they said to pull over and he's like kept on going and so they do that they start they tear the car apart search yeah. everything. they didn't find anything except uh weed rolling papers right and that was it and i didn't have luckily for that time i didn't have cocaine but there were times where i went through that border and i had coke on me and you know that would have been we would have been fucked yeah that's thank god you weren't i love that we're admitting all of it on this podcast yeah uh, but that's fine uh, I don't know how any of this works. It's all we're all st we're comedians. Yeah, it's all make them ups. I had a, the only other thing I ever. I mean, I've stole other things, but the other. Can thing, I tell you a pullover star though. All right, yeah, no, you yeah. go first. You go first. You go first. But the only other in terms of jobs and stealing. Sure. And I'll hear your your uh, you pullover story. Yeah, yeah, I'll hear, yeah, I'll hear what you got to say. But the thing that I did was I'd work at you know a restaurant, Chili's, Dave and Buster's. I was a waiter for a long time. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. And whenever you have birthdays, a lot of times they'd get comped. Yeah. So if somebody paid cash on something and they got like a cake even if it wasn't their birthday i'd be like oh hey this person had a birthday just so i could make the extra few adds bucks the tip yeah so i'd add to the tip or you know somebody cheated me i'd hey fuck you i'm writing into your that's your birthday yeah you fucked my, me over yeah. well it's your birthday today, pal. yeah and are you gonna call you know amex on like two more dollars oh because, you like, would write it on the tip i would do i would do that too if somebody fucked me you got to give me 20 percent. i deserve it <laughs> dude to that let me tell you this this kid i work with named ryan at fortune office this I don't hope I, I don't know if I've ever told this on the podcast before. This kid was fucking amazing. He yeah. was sweet. I love this guy. Um, he used to do a move where at the at the end of each transaction, they'd ask for your phone number. Uh -huh. Like you get your phone number to be part of the Fortune Offs right. company or group, you know, coupon deal, whatever. And any girl from like eighteen, or I don't know how old he was, but let's just say eighteen to forty, he would go. Uh, can we have your phone number for the after furniture sale? And they would go, no. And he go, but what about for me? And he would say that to every single girl. And he go, 90% of them would go, what? No. And he'd go, okay. And then every now and again, he'd get one. And he would do it. He did every, and I said once, like, dude, every, you ask every girl for the number? And he goes, I see. And he had it. He was like, I see usually 50 girls a day. Yeah. You know, if I can get one number a day, that's five numbers a week. If one of the five calls me back, I can go on one date a week, yeah. 52 weeks, 52 dates. I'll be married in three years. He had this shit written down, right? right. I'm like, that is fucking crazy, right? Anyway, moving forward, I see he has a little piece of paper. There's a cue on it, and he would just put a line right next to each other. And this is like a while later. And I go, what the fuck is this cue thing? Yeah. And he said, anytime someone pays cash and they give them change, if it's more than a quarter, I take a quarter out of their change. And he would, and he just write down how many quarters he's shorting people in the change. He goes, end of the day, if I'm shorting this many quarters, it was whatever. <laughs> what I remember was he said, it comes out to 83 bucks a week. To take a girl out usually costs me around 83 <laughs> yeah. bucks a week. So he had this number system for getting dates, right. then had this number system for Cheating paying people, for the yeah. dates. That's all that. That's the past. COVID happens. I see him on Facebook and I'm like, dude, how the fuck have you been? We start chatting and uh, he's got kids, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, man, dude, I remember you used to do this shit with the girl, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, yeah, man. I was like, you know how I met my wife? And I was like, how? He goes, uh, at Fortune Offs, where I worked. And I go, you asked her for her number? He goes, no, I shorted her a quarter. And she came back and yelled at me that I she noticed that I shorted her a quarter. And I was like, this girl I love. And that's how he fell in love with this girl, that she was the one person oh, uh, noticed he was short at a quarter and came back. Because these were like thousand dollar deals. They'd sell like Yadro and all that. Shit. Right, right. So Who it was cares like about a quarter. Quarter, a quarter. She did. And that was the woman that like he married. And and I was also like, I was convinced 
you'd be in jail by now. Right. And right. he was like, no, nah, you like ran some business. But he's like, but he's got his eye on Bitcoin, like all that shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, he had like these little scam that he would do, which I thought was like amazing. Yeah. Um, you could if you could get away with it, hey, all the better. Get away right. with it and get out. But a quarter, because even think if you short someone a quarter, they're gonna go, hey, they're either not gonna care or they're gonna be showing me a quarter. And you go, fuck, sorry, so many. Yeah, I had a, uh, there was a school bully who used to take, you know, your uh, lunch change. Did you ever have that? Oh, they would ask. They wouldn't take Maybe it. Like, they'd ask. They'd yeah, go, they'd ask. They'd be like, like, hey, you have change. any change? Yeah, let me get your change. And that adds up. I mean, you go around and you have, you know, 20 kids that give you 50 cents. Yeah. You know, you got. That's $4. <laughs> $4 is a lot when we were in nice yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. That was good math. I got pulled over Is once. Is that math? I meant 25 cents. I don't I do math and I cower at math. Yeah. <laughs> so I just say anything. It sounded like it was good math. It's probably wrong. Nobody knows. <laughs> so I'll tell you this one, and then you can tell me if you have anything like this. Yeah. I get pulled over one time because I grew up in uh, Bloomfield but on the edge of East Orange and Newark. And it was uh -huh. real like, uh, uh, I was the only white guy, really. It was like a couple white guys, not a lot of white people down yeah. there. And uh, I had a nice Volkswagen GTI. It was like shiny and had nice rims. So whenever I was driving, I'd be driving home, constantly get pulled over because people were like, he's the going to buy drugs. Or is it why he's either a drug dealer right, or he's going why to buy are you drugs? There? Why is he there? They'd always pull me over constantly. Um, and I was straight edge at the time. I didn't even do drugs. I get pulled over one time, give the guy my license and registration. He says, give me your license. And I went, I handed it to you. And he was like, you didn't fucking hand shit to me. He starts getting loud. And I'm like, officer, I'm telling you. I gave you my license, right? Loses his shit, pulls his gun on me, opens the door, pulls me out of the fucking car. Whole thing is going on. I'm freaking out. I thought I'm gonna fucking die. Next thing I know, I, I more cars come. Cop comes out and he goes, uh, is that little Gregory? Right? Turn around. It's a, it's a cop. He's my baseball coach. Yeah. He grabs this other cop. This is why people go like, blah, 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 blah. I get a little mad sometimes. He grabs the other cop. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? This kid is a good kid. He was on my baseball team. And he's yeah. like, what, the, what is he? He goes, he didn't. He told me he was lying about his license. He doesn't have his license. He's trying to bullshit. Right. Whatever. Cop bends down. Like my license is on the floor. And he yeah. goes, this fucking license. Yeah. Right. Wow. I listen to this whole thing happening. Um, meanwhile, also, uh, uh, I'm being like. Everyone is watching me. Yeah. Everyone is watching me like on the fucking ground. Right. This cop, whatever. They, and whatever. Let's go. The other cop leaves. And then my baseball coach is there. And uh, he and he, my baseball cart just starts looking at shit in the car. And he was like, you see that? That's hanging. That's a coupon. I'm gonna give you coupons for all. He's like making fun of me and shit yeah. on me for this. But it was like, dude, that cop had a gun to my head. Right. Over nothing. Holy and shit. literally because I was so bad at baseball. Yeah. Because I had double vision. I wasn't good. I bonded with this coach. Yeah, he remembered you. He remembered me because I would just sit and talk to him and like we would laugh because he would like because I was I was always on the bench and yeah. he was like, yeah, got me out of it. But uh, that's just a one. I've been had like a gun pulled on me a few times uh, just growing up in Bloomfield. Jeez. Yeah, it was crazy. But I didn't was, know that. I thought Bloomfield is like a nice. The North End is nice. Yeah. And it's gotten way better now. Uh -huh. um, but the South End was bad. I think the South End got a lot better now. I oh, think okay. the center is nice. But yeah. uh, it was. Uh, Rough. We used to rollerblade. We go rollerblading in Newark, and uh, dude, we were fucking skating on this great rail. It was like a low rail, and we yeah. were just like hitting the rail. And this cop comes up to us once, and he was like, "You guys need to leave." And we were like, "No, man, we can skate. This is prop." There he goes. This are he was like these are the what these are like the Ironbound project. Like there's yeah. some crazy project. He goes, these people are in gangs, and they will come kill you. So you need to leave right now. Yeah, Newark is no joke. But we didn't realize. We thought the cop was being a dick, and that cop was just like. Looking out for you. Yeah, these kids in rollerblades yeah. need to get the fuck out of here before yeah. someone comes and kills them. Well, that's the thing is, and I mean, one of the scariest things are, you know, I mean, when we're kids, you're kind of fearless, but other kids are fearless too. So they don't think of the, you know, yeah. any of the consequences that come with, you know, hey, you're 14 and if you have a gun, you're like, oh, I'll shoot somebody. Who cares? Like, right. You have, I'll just shoot somebody. Most, you know, 14 year olds can't process, you know, the meaning of life. You, uh, what do you think the scariest? Do you have any of the, what's the thing the scary, the, the closest you've ever been to death? You got any of those? You got anything in there? Uh, I mean, probably just some of like the drugs that I did in terms of, you know. <laughs> oh, really? But, yeah. I mean, I never, I, I never. You ever seem like a drug guy to me? I mean, I mean, I did them, you know, and yeah. probably, you know, just uh, where you're, you know, didn't know what would be in a drug and just taking it anyway. But I never had any, I don't think I ever had any, you know, near death experience before mm -hmm. so i can't you know outside of just oh i you know just taking a drug and not knowing necessarily what's in it, it could what was the worst drug me. you ever took 
the worst. I mean, cocaine, I think, is pretty rough, right? No, I don't know if that I did coke. Right. I did uh, ecstasy. You know, I had Molly. Um, and that's really it. I never did anything, you know, more Not than too that. Bad. Yeah. I don't think. I don't know. I only ever smoke weed, but that seems, that's crazy to me. Weed is crazy to me. I get real high. Yeah. And, and when you, you know, if you ever did a, like something else, like, you know, uh, something like, you know, ecstasy, uh, it's kind of a, I mean, it changes your whole, you know, yeah. mind. I, I mean, it, I think it, I think it definitely had a huge effect on me. I definitely at the time, I think, you know, now I've, <laughs> I've yeah. overcome it, but uh, you, you experience something like that, you know, taking mushrooms or whatever, it kind of changes a little your perception on things for a little while. Mm. And then you're like, oh, wow. You, you don't even look at when you're on those drugs. You're like, you do not look at the world the same way. D- much different than, you know, marijuana. You think you cha- What do you think changed it? What do, do I, I think? Do you get any changes? Like, what are the things you were like? I don't know necessarily if I, I don't, I don't think I've changed anything from the way that, you know, I mean, you said you, it have, changes your mind, right? Well, well how did it change? Well, it? so I mean, one thing would be, so I think you're just trying to sell me ecstasy. Right? <laughs> exactly. yeah. I could <laughs> I got get back into it. <laughs> you can get back in the game. I think, you know, you kind of realize, uh, or I remember thinking on certain, on those drugs on whether it's, you know, ecstasy or, you know, mushrooms that, you know, you were doing all these things, you know, a podcast or what's, what's the real purpose of your, of your, of your actual existence? What's your, right. your meaning to be doing stuff. And, you know, we hustle to do comedy and we hustle to do, you know, jobs and pay bills. And sometimes you get caught up in all that stuff. And is it, you know, all that stuff really worth it. And I think it kind of just offers you a, a little bit of uh, perspective on your life. Do you think any of it's of, worth it? No, I don't. I think okay. I, I think also co- kind of COVID, you know, going through and being around, you know, family and stuff and seeing what's out there of, of like, all right, yeah, I could do spots. I could, you know, post on uh, social media and all that stuff. But life is happening right in front of you and kind of living, you know, more for now. Yeah. Then, you know, looking at whether it's social media or looking at what other people are doing. And I think, that, you know, if you could have more kind of live your life the way that you want it to be lived instead of focused on what other people are doing and what else is going on and really dedicate your time in a worthwhile fashion. That was the thing that hit me with COVID for real. And it was a little before, a little after, I don't really know, but definitely with COVID it hit me. But like a lot of comedians, and I think I think this way and I try to like not think this way, was the whole idea was... um you want to be working on the new hour. You want to be working on like what's going to get you the next thing. But n- none of it is about the honest art, right? Even comedians yeah. look at comedy and they're like, what Bill Burr wouldn't do this joke or this isn't real comedy or this isn't good comedy. Yeah. And like they don't look at it as like you're an artist that yeah. you're not in competition with those people. No, you're not you're being not. those people. You need to be. You. You're honestly someone guy that I think is very different, especially from our group. And also, I want to say that, you know, I said this to you before, but like fucking leveled up. You were always a great comic. Uh, but thanks, like, buddy. especially coming back from COVID, seeing you do these spots, it's like for your style, uh, you, you're, you've become very strong. I mean, I'm not strong, like good comedian, but I mean, so what I mean is when I go on stage, I'll talk sometimes with a lower. I dict- I command the stage and no one fucks with me. Yeah. You always were a great joke writer. Great joke writer, hands down. And like a little, not shyer, but more of like a, hey, everybody, how you doing? I'm Gary. You know? Yeah, yeah. But even you do that now, you do that at 100%. So it's almost uninterruptible. Like you command the stage. You're the most of that voice, right. which I think is like a, Mitch Hedberg to me is a great example of this. Is it like, people think he was like low energy or whatever but like he was the most himself and i think that you're at this level now where you're like so much more yourself and like com- like it's it's commanding and i watched you do 45 in the backyard and it was great thanks you know what i mean it was like and yeah i, I think, don't think a lot of people doing that style yeah can i mean do that i think you know uh in general in style we're always picking like we kind of over time mm-hmm. you know we figure out now do what me ma- now do me no just kidding. yeah no <laughs> but like we figured out what what makes us both feel comfortable and yeah and uh how you talk to people and how you could kind of get your you know point of view across and yeah i look at it the way that i do it and and you know i see the of course like the way that you do it if like yeah you don't want people to fuck with you and if they did if somehow decide to fuck with you you just could you know fuck with them right back and and it's almost like why are you interrupting this guy who's doing his thing you know it's like everything's going fine there's also no fear of in the beginning there's fear that someone will interrupt you yeah feel fear, fear of that and fear of 
you failing in general. Yeah. So once you can eliminate your own fear of failing and not really think about the consequences or care about the consequences, obviously you still, you still want to do well, right. but it's less on your mind because you're more secure. Kind of like, you know, driving a car, it's like, you got to be confident behind the wheel. So you're behind the wheel for the show. Absolutely. And if you, you know, if you think about failure, if you're like, Oh, I'm going to do terrible, I'm going to do terrible. You're going to, you probably still won't cause you've been doing it for so long, but you're not going to have as great of a set right. because you're in your, you're just fucking with yourself. Yeah. So, so you never should, you know, uh, people, I remember going on stage and I'm like, oh, this is going to go just almost like psyching myself out to on purpose yes. to think that maybe that could be helpful. Right. And be like, I'm going to do terrible. I'm going to do terrible. And, you know, just be like, don't even think about just go and do because that's all you have to do. When I walk on stage, before I go on stage, I usually have the mantra in my head of to psych myself up. I'll go, I can't wait to tell these people this story. I, yeah. That's my that's my personality on stage. And I try to think that. So I go. So I don't get mad or whatever. I go, oh, I can't wait to tell these jokes. And that usually does. Do you uh, do you have anything like if you're like, what is would you do anything before you get on stage? It's like to amp yourself a little bit or any kind of like. But I just to think get you in the right Gary position. <laughs> I always think, I mean, the best thing is yeah, if you could just have a quick line before you have to get into your set. Yeah. You know, so if I think of one, I'm, oh, that good. You know, oh, and it, best. And whatever way, you know, it's, it's funny. I was just watching. um comedian you know like uh Jerry Sandler. yeah and it's on netflix now so uh you know check that guy out he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's doing all right yeah but that's a you know comedian is a doc that you know comics have watched i, I mean it can't, it's so interesting because it came out by i was doing comedy uh i started doing comedy in like 2007 late 2007 and comedian I, I was watching that before i started doing comedy then i started watching it while i started doing comedy and it means something different each time you watch it. But, you know, in that he talks about not, you know, sticking to the act and not saying any, you know, starting with anything that's new. Never. It's about like riffing off the top. He never. Right. And it's and riffing off the top where, you know, just have a, you know, a line that you just thought of. It's good. It's good to say that because it's establishing the crowd. And I always thought that was, you know, to me, that's such a weird thing. I see where obviously comedy has changed over time right. where it's about, you know, it's really good to come out with content. Of course you want qu quality content, right. but in that setting where, you know, I was just watching comedian where I'm like, Oh, he doesn't, he just wants you to, you know, do the act and yeah, you could have new stuff, but you know, kind of, you know, put it in the middle, which I still think if you have a new joke, put that in the middle. But as far as the beginning goes, getting yourself in the mindset is, uh, you know, having a, like a little bit of a riff. And if that hits, it's like a really good momentum boost. Yeah, I, I never, um, I can't open with a joke. I always have to come out and just be fun. Yeah. Come out I, screaming. Yeah. I always say, like, I have to throw the parachute out of the plane, jump after the parachute, <laughs> and hope to God I catch it. Yeah. I do know that I have a joke that I could get to that will kill and I'll get to it. Right. So I always walk on stage and I go, well, who the fuck is this guy? Well, what are we doing? Who am I? You know, and like, yeah. people go, well, this is weird. Who's this guy? I love this. Like, he's got crazy weird energy. I can't. And I, I noticed that because I remember seeing comedians, they'd come out and they'd be like, uh, hey, I know I look like uh, the guy from Top Chef meets uh, Kim Jong-un. Right. And you're like, whatever. And like that always just seems so unnatural to me. And, uh, you know, my style, I think, is more trying to be conversational. Um, but so like I, I can't start with something written. I can't yeah. start with something like absolutely yeah, yeah. written. But I want to get back to the point I was asking you that I forgot. Is it like comedians have forgotten that like what they're doing is their art? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like we get so interested in being famous and people telling us that we're good that you forget about actually like trying to be artistic. And um, I want you few something to say go up, but I wanted to ask you something about me that a problem I'm having right now. And I wonder if you've ever had this problem, but you go ahead and did you have something, something um, on your lips. I see on your lips? No, well, I was just going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, as far as like being artistic or whatever. I think, uh, you know, we're all different. You know, we look at, as COVID has, you know, proven it's like your, your comedy that you do has nothing to do with somebody else. I, I could look at somebody like, you know, Andrew Schultz and be like, that's amazing what he has. That's amazing what Tim Dillon has. It, it really is. It's amazing. Yeah. But I don't do that. You don't do that. So, you know, you don't being, sell ice cream. Yeah. You sell hamburgers. I wish that, uh, yeah, I had the, you know, they're doing great financially and everything. I wish, but it's like, I have to figure out what I'm doing and how to build what I'm doing. And that's all that matters. What, you know, other people do. Um, it's like, Hey, it's great. It's great 
for them and everything. And, but that's, uh, that's not what I do. I yeah. don't, you know, I, I don't have the time to, uh, or want to constantly put out like, uh, clips on Instagram. I, to me, I hate Instagram, Yeah, but of course you need a social media following. And there's, when I have stuff, I'll definitely put it out, but I don't want to do it where it's like my everyday lifestyle. Yeah. And, it, and it's tough, but it works, you know, for whatever someone's trying to build, if that's what they're, you know, building, then build it. But that for me personally, that doesn't work. And that's not to discredit what anyone else. No, I mean, I'm trying to do it, but I'm not trying to do like videos. I'm trying to be better on social media because I'm at this point where in my career, where I'm like uh, every headlining set I get is was a knife fight with the club yeah. to try to get. And it's like, I can't. And I, I can't deal with the industry anymore. So it's like if I could just put this stuff out and to just get start, back, yeah, get more just yeah. to get more fans. So I can uh, be like, look, I, these people will come to a show. This this can add. And I love podcasting. I do love this. Yeah. So like if I could build this, it's great. Um, can I tell you about the problem I'm having? Yeah, yeah. I don't know where we'll go with it. I don't know. You might. Ha- I don't know what this is. I, it, it even might not even be a good problem. But I've been working on like a religion chunk. I would say for years. Yeah. And I'm finally like, you know, I didn't put it on one album. I still did the jokes, whatever. And it always comes to a point where like, I don't like turning some of the audience with that, but I get so much more. I always do so much better when I'm just up having a good time being the fun boy, you know, but I have these things I want to say, but those things I want to say don't necessarily do as well as the fun stuff on stage. So I just remember comedians saying things like, Oh, I love those jokes, but I could never do those jokes. Mm-hmm. Right. And I hated that. I hated when comedians would say that, like they like Jim Gaffin saying, like, he can't talk about cunts or whatever. And I'm like, no, yeah. you can. Right. You should if you want to. But now I'm thinking that maybe I am wrong. Maybe I need to start selling people more what the Greg brand is, as opposed to like these things I want to do. Or is it just shoving that shit into the Greg brand? Or maybe those jokes just aren't good. Like, you know, it's like it could be any of those three things. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been through that or if you know what I'm talking about or if you could just tell me I'm funny uh, and I'm not <laughs> a failure. Um, no, I don't know. Well, you, you know are, what I'm saying? Well, you are funny. Yeah. And it is. You're trying to figure out what what is going to be your selling point. And I do. I think putting clips on online is great. I think that clip, one of my favorite clips that anyone's put out is your clip of at the seller and you telling, you know, oh. finding out that that person, you know, uh, mother or father murdered their mother. And, and, and that's what people love the most about me. So then I try to keep trying to recreate that. And it's like, I don't want to be that guy. Well, you know what I mean? I want well, to have substance. Well, I think like for any clips that are on Instagram, it's the only way to, you know, to put, put jokes out is say, you know, if you were to put a special out and then you have all these clips from that. Right. But right now, outside of that, you nobody wants to burn their actual material uh, to an audience because that's all they have. So right. putting out whatever crowd work that's out there is good. You're, you know, you're spontaneous, clever, and off, you know, off the top of your head, you know, you could could come up with stuff. So I think clipping that stuff is so important. But I kind of was asking. I want to see him like a weirdo. Yeah, I was more asking. Have you ever run into that thing where you go, "I would love to talk about this, but I feel like I can't. This doesn't fit, Gary." You know what I mean? Yeah, sometimes. And I, I think um, you kind of, you might, I think you try it to kind of feel right. it out. And, you know, I mean, I've heard this before, you know, be your, be, you have to be your own editor. So you're figuring that out. And if it feels weird or you start realizing, oh, there's a dip in my act when I'm doing this, then you get out of it. But there's no harm in trying it. Right. Because you figure it out. Because how many times have you thought of a joke and you're like, and after you're like, oh, that worked. And you're like, wow, I finally have a, a joke on, you know, toaster ovens. Right. It's like, I can't believe I do. Not like, so it's just something that, you know, you don't expect. And it kind of, it happens eventually. Sometimes I'll have a dip, and but it'll be about something I like. And yeah. I'll go, well, I don't care. This <laughs> yeah. is for the one guy who might really love this joke. Yeah. As opposed to like the crowd of like 70% Christians who might hate it. You know, right. So I'm like, no, I'll, I'll sell this. This I'm selling this joke to the three atheists in the crowd, or or the three guys who collect GI Joe. I, I just don't that's, know if that's smart that's, or not smart. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's hard. Who cares? You know, I watch certain people. Certain, you know, some people who have like bigger uh, fan bases than us, and they're able to say whatever they want to say, or say whatever they want to say. You know, to them. You know, Ari. Yeah. Ari's a big one. You know, Ari has his, a fan base, and he says whatever, and they his crowd feeds off of that. Yeah. And but. You know, he goes into, you know, a room at New York Comedy Club where 
you know, maybe it's random people, maybe 20 percent are on board with him because they're fans. I've seen Bill Burr at the cellar. Right. You know, same thing. He'll have 20 percent. You know, it's just it's a numbers game at that yeah. point. Not everybody know, you know, as Bill Burr, not everybody knows him. Right. So I would love to see Bill Burr in a room of people who really know who he is. Yeah. Well, at the cellar, it happens, too, where, you know, as much as, you know, that's a smart comedy crowd still uh, you know there's a good number of people that are like who is this guy yeah <laughs> and and they don't know what they're getting and then you know they either love him or you know he divides part of them yeah i have a friend who gets in his head a lot about bill burr because he thinks and i will be honest i'm not gonna say his name he to me sounds nothing like bill burr but people yeah. he'll get like little tags ago this guy got bill seems like bill burr right right and he's like i'm not bill burr and it, it upsets him because they both he's like but we're both we both scream you yeah. know or like we're both yeah, we're both angry right. and i go yeah well that's and he's like so i'm like first of all what are you gonna do because okay so if you're similar are you gonna stop doing what you do right what are you gonna do one-liners also if you walked into mcdonald's and then you walked into and said hey this place has got a real shake shack feel yeah. it's like yeah they're both selling burgers, which is completely fucking different things. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are comedians we know who sound like David Tell, but are different. And I don't want them to leave comedy. Right. You know what I mean? I'm like, this is one of my favorite comedians. And yeah. there I can I taste a little David Tell in there. But it's just like tasting a little beef in the stew. Yeah. And I think that's totally fine because I mean, think of, I mean, you look at Kobe Bryant, he has Michael Jordan attributes. You know, right. I mean, you're gonna of course you're gonna have these guys affect comedy. Yeah. Bill Burr. There's going to be some sprinkles of Bill Burr in people. There's going to be sprinkles of Mitch Hedberg, you know, all this. People sound I have the writing skills of Carlin, the performance of Regan, and the personality and looks of Brad Pitt. <laughs> Not the personality of Brad Pitt, personality of me, because I'm the... Anyway, no one says that. I don't know, that was a dumb thing. Um, but we're about ready to wrap up here, because you got to go home. Uh, <laughs> you got to go. Yeah. Where are you going to go? You got to go. Uh, Barry, first of all, thank you. We didn't, Thanks, even, get, we didn't even tell. We didn't even talk. We, I got to have you come back. We didn't even talk about the thing we we're going to talk about. The story. <laughs> yeah. I had you literally like, oh, we could talk about that show we just did. I know. Well, the show was crazy. You know, yeah. we did a show. In the we backyard. did a show in the backyard. It was bad for a bunch of crazy people, but they were nice. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was fun. This was fun. <laughs> that was fun. Did you have fun? I had a great time. What could I do better next time? I'm trying to get better at each interview. Nothing. Have have more toys. <laughs> I yeah, took some down. Yeah. No, it looks great. All right. Also, Steve Rogers, little guy, left this jacket. You're a little guy. Yeah, I got to jacket. Probably just yeah. take that jacket. Um, I can take it. What do uh, what do what do you where do uh, people want to find you? Uh, Instagram, as I say. <laughs> I'll post your stuff too, Gary on Instagram. What's your name? With Gary Veter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did I even introduce you? I think you did. It's fine. I'll All post right. up. You could put a little thing there. That says my name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll I'll do an intro and then I'll do an outro. Oh, that's great. Mike. I'll do an intro and outro if we can. If you have a minute after we go. No where do you follow? Where do I follow you? You follow me at Gary Veter on Instagram, Twitter, uh, or GaryVeter.com. And you have an album? Hello, oh, I have a comedy album. Yeah, Veter Las Vegas, and yeah, it could be great. purchased on you know iTunes or listen to Spotify. And come out to the cellar and see him when he's on. He's or if he's in a town near you, he's so funny live. Thanks, brother. And we did Americans Got Town together. You should watch oh, those clips. Had, those were. Those I mean, were talk about the biggest. I mean, if we were going to talk, oh, this would have been great for the scam. I didn't even think about it. That was a but, great yeah. scam. I mean, yeah, I was getting married at the time, and then uh, I wanted you to be my roommate instead of telling <laughs> telling them that I was getting married. Yeah, we just pretended, and I didn't know where to go because some people were like, "What's it like being Gary's roommate?" And I'll go, "Good." And <laughs> yeah. other people were like, "Gary's roommate." And I go, "Yeah." And they go, "I know you're not his roommate." Like, yeah. I, like the the producer guys we were working with, those two dudes, yeah, were they super knew. cool. They knew, but then like the heads up didn't. Yeah, they didn't know. I tell you, one of the biggest comedy fails in my life during that whole thing is happening. Howie Mandel walks out to me and goes, I want to see you here next year. Yeah. And I went, that's not really my style. Oh, my God. Well, because I tell stories and I didn't think I could do it in two minutes. I didn't have the confidence. I should have fucking went. And I didn't try. And I should have had you play in my roommate. We could have brought the whole thing oh, back. We could have brought it back. We could still. Yeah, we could still. Bring yeah, it I'll, back. I'll talk to the producers. <laughs> we'll do America's Got Talent next year. Anyway, Gary, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Thanks for checking this out. If you love this, go to my Patreon. It's called the Greg Stone Zone. Uh, we've got you get an extra episode every week, and then there's multiple tiers with multiple things. There's so much funny shit on there. I just put up an album of music I made, which is batshit crazy. You'll love it. Uh, there's so much fun, funny content that really you'll get in there, and then the support really helps. So please check that out. Uh, Buff Uncle. Big up your head. Big up your body. On the bus, it's time to party, it's Gregory. 
Oh, Friday night, Gregory 